said, your lips are moving, so you must be speaking. Some people say, we can see but not hear me. No, no. There we go. Yeah, good sound. So anybody who cannot see and hear me uh, has not hit refresh. Yeah, raise your hand. (laughs) Out of luck. All right. If you can't see and hear me, you have not hit refresh. We're starting. All right. Yesterday, my boss, we're going to go ahead and start. We're not going to do the usual waiting for a few minutes because uh, those of you who are here on time, um, you win. Yesterday, my boss interrupted me while I was taking care of a patient. She wanted to know if I had really worked 12 hours one day last week, which is, of course, a way of saying, are you a stinking liar, without taking a lunch break. I told her, yes, I really had not taken a break. Uh, She doubted me and then said, I needed to not do this. We were so busy that day that I could not get away. The way she asked the question was very condescending. How can I deal with this woman? Uh, The tone of the question that you're asking is clearly one of that you feel like a victim. You feel feel one or two or three less than your boss. Notice what you said. You said, my boss interrupted me while I was taking care of a patient. First thing that I would ask you is, did you allow your boss to interrupt you while you were seeing the patient? Uh, So I would ask, you know, if you are seeing the patient, if the boss came in while you were seeing a patient, the very first thing that I would say to the boss is, um, I'll be happy to talk to you about this uh, when I'm finished, or at the very least say to the boss, uh, do you want me to interrupt seeing this patient uh, to answer your question? And then I would certainly not conduct this conversation in the presence of the patient. Then I would immediately step out into the hall and say, um, is it your intent or is it the policy of the practice to um, interrupt the seeing of patients um, to handle clerical matters? In other words, would you want me to come and interrupt you to conduct a clerical matter? Do you think that reflects well on the patient? How do you think the uh, patient feels when we're interrupted or when the patient is interrupted during an exam uh, to handle a matter that's just of clerical importance? Uh, Or do you think it would be better to wait while I'm between patients to handle things like this? The reason I'm asking is uh, I know that you're interested in the best overall uh, health of the practice, and I wonder if this reflects well on the practice when we handle things like this uh, in this way. See, you're you're letting the boss intimidate you just because she's the boss instead of thinking about the overall uh, well-being of the practice. Uh, You're allowing yourself to be treated like an underling instead of thinking of yourself as uh, a physician or a uh, healthcare practitioner in the practice. Then, once you're in the discussion, when the, when the boss says, okay, well, I don't want you to do that again. I don't want you to work, work 12 hours without a break. You know, it's really easy to whine uh, when people come to me and they say, I don't want you to do that. I don't like that. Okay, um, but your whining doesn't interest me. What I want to hear is, how would you suggest that I do that differently? In fact, when people come to me and they say, I don't like what you did, and they don't have a better way, um, I will sometimes even respond to them. Um, Your whining is like the buzzing of flies to me. Uh, If all you've got is whining and you don't have a better way, why did you bother to tell me? Uh, All I'm interested in is suggestions about how to do it better. So what I would say to the boss is, uh, here were the circumstances on that day, just like you said here. We were so busy that day. We were busy with patients. Um, It was all I could do to work from the beginning of the day to the end uh, for the welfare of the patients and the practice. There was no free time. So tell me, how would you suggest that I handle that? And then you just wait. And the boss says, well, I don't know, but, but I don't think you should have taken a break. You say, no, it's not enough to say, don't take a break. 
what are you suggesting that I should have done? Because you can't create an hour where there isn't one or 30 minutes of break where there isn't one. You can't create time where there isn't time. So I'm asking you, what should I have done? And if the boss doesn't have a better idea, well then go blow smoke out the back of the building. Uh, uh, I did the best I could do. Uh, so I'm looking for your ideas. When I was a resident uh, in uh, getting my uh, surgical training, we had a boss who was just a, a terror to the residents. And he was famous for coming in the room and telling people what they should and should not do. And people were given impossible tasks. He would come in and tell them to do this thing or that thing. And people would just scale walls trying to please this man. And I decided many years ago that when people give you an impossible task, you stop them and say, N no, uh -uh. you tell me how you'd do this. Uh, it was the rule of the, the, pra of the residency that we couldn't moonlight. In other words, after our usual hours, we couldn't work in emergency rooms. And uh, I didn't just moonlight. <laughs> I was the actual director of scheduling for an entire emergency room. So I did the scheduling for dozens of other physicians. And one day he came into a staff meeting and he put out his cigar and he stomped and fumed and he said there will be no more moonlighting in this residency program and slammed his fist down and looked around the table and, and I said, uh, all right, then um, increase my salary 50%. And he looked down at me and I said, uh, I moonlight and I schedule moonlighting for half the residents in the surgery program. And unless you're willing to increase my salary by 50%, I can't live on what you pay me. Single residents can barely live, and I have four kids. So what do you propose? If you have a solution, I'm thrilled to hear it, and I don't live extravagantly. And he said, well, and he stumbled and muttered, and, and he said, well, don't let it get in the way of your duties. And he slammed his fist down, and he stomped out. <laughs> well, in, in that one sentence, he changed the entire policy of the practice. So people were allowed to moonlight because he recognized that it was an impossible situation. They couldn't pay us more. We had to moonlight. So don't be intimidated, and yet don't be difficult. You're just looking for solutions. And don't be a victim. Here's a question that says, how would you handle a boss that tells you, uh, I hurt his feelings? Well, it depends on the situation. I mean, if the boss says you hurt my feelings, then you explore why. You say, so, so tell me how I hurt your feelings. And when the boss says, well, you did this and this and this and this, and you say, wow, I was unaware that, that what I had done would affect you in those ways. Um, I'll certainly be more mindful of what I've done because you can't apologize for hurting his feelings because you know, understanding the principles of real love, you don't hurt anybody's feelings. People's feelings are hurt as a result of the lack of real love in their lives. Well, you're not gonna deliver your boss a lecture on real love. By the way, here's a book that I need you to read, a uh, little much. But you can say, hmm, I was uh, unaware that what I did uh, would affect you in that way. You can certainly say that. Notice, you haven't apologized for anything. But you can say, I was unaware that what I did would affect you in that way. That's honest, and it comes across as honest, clean, open. You're listening. Whereas, oh, I'm so sorry, comes across as kind of whiny and victimy. It's way more honest and open just to say, hmm, I was unaware that I would have that effect. Another question, every time I have an accomplishment in my life and I share it with my father, he says something about his other kids, my half-brother and sister. I sent him a video I made and he responded by emailing me a write-up on my younger sister that appeared in a publication. I know I'm looking for praise and acceptance from my dad, but it really hurts that he can't or refuses to see me. 
This has been going on for 20 years. It's critical that you recognize, like you said here, I know I'm looking for praise and acceptance from my dad, but you don't quite have it. Yeah, you realize it, but you also need to see the rest of it. You're looking for that praise and acceptance. You're looking for imitation love to still give you some measure of happiness. You're hoping that if you get some measure of imitation love from your father, that somehow that's going to make you happier. And it won't. It's, it's, almost, a, it's almost a cornerstone of life in our society that we believe that if we get acceptance or what we call love and isn't from, our, from certain people, our husbands, our wives, our children, our lovers, our mothers, our fathers, if we get acceptance, praise, power, certain forms of imitation love from the, that handful, that nuclear handful of people, that that is more important than getting it from anybody else. We've all been taught that. We, we say the phrase, a mother's love, in almost like reverent tones. It's like the most important thing. Um, the term falling in love is the thing that we look for all of our lives. There are certain kinds of love that we think are more magical than any others. And it turns out that it's all a lie that the only kind of love that matters is real love. Real love from anybody. Unconditional love from any source heals. Whereas imitation love from anyone, no amount of imitation love from anyone, will ever heal us, will ever make us whole, will ever make us happy. And yet we hang on to it because we've heard that lie so many times. If only I did the right things, then maybe my father would love me and then I'd be happy. People hang on to it not only their whole lives long, they hang on to it after death. After their parents have died, they still hope that somehow they wish, if only they had done things differently, that even beyond the grave they'd get some token of approval, some sign from their parents that they were accepted. And that's not what matters. In fact, if we have to do something to get a sign of approval from somebody else, then it ain't real love. So what's the key here? Letting it go. It's pretty, uh, your father's made it pretty clear, as in screamingly obvious for the last 20 years or more, that he doesn't know how to unconditionally love you. How many evidences do you need? I don't have it. So you get it from the people who do. Now, what if someday he were to learn to give it to you? Well, neat. But the cool thing is you don't need it from him. It actually sets you free once you see that. As long as you think you have to be loved by him, you're a prisoner to him. And it's a terrible way to live. The odds that he'll learn after all these years to love you unconditionally are pretty slim. Somebody says, I have a recovery group I meet with each, blah, 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 meet with each week. Is it possible? Oh, the person who just asked that question said, thanks, Greg, I get it. I hope so. This is, a, this is what I just said is not an easy subject. And once we do get it, it sets us free in a way I just can't begin to describe. Being captive to a need to be loved by certain people is a lifetime of prison. It really is. Somebody says, I have a recovery group I meet with each week. Is it possible to buy a DVD containing your top ten to introduce these basic principles to them. Hmm. Well, we have DVDs that introduce pretty much all the principles, like in the essentials, 
that's a three DVD set. Um, then there's the top ten that are on the website, so you could have a computer there, and there's the top ten. There's not a DVD that has the top ten on it. Um, seems like it'd be pretty easy to record. Can't help you with that. Email Mike and ask him. Let me read the next question, and then we'll do one on the screen. Uh, somebody asked, and as I'm reading this, I can't remember who sent it. So if it's you, put your name up on the screen for me, because I just can't remember. Uh, somebody asked, when are you going to write Real Love and Grandparenting? Um, when I grow an extra brain and get an extra six hours in a day. When it comes to my son, his wife, and my grandkids, I feel like I'm always tiptoeing through a minefield, which is your biggest problem, is that you're feeling afraid of them. Before I read anything further, I'm not kidding you, that's your biggest problem. You're afraid of their response to, to you. And as long as you're afraid, you're dead. If you go into any relationship with your kids, your grandkids, anybody, and you're not afraid, you'll do 10 times better than if you are. And then if you make mistakes, you go, oops, I made a mistake. Whereas if you're afraid, you're going to A, screw up more often. B, when you do screw up, your reactions to your screw-ups will be much worse. So you feel like you're walking through a minefield, you're like doomed to start with. It's very difficult to maintain my real love equilibrium when I'm at their house. You're afraid of them. That's what you're saying. It's full of empty drowning people. I got that. I got that they're drowning. You need to make enough real love calls with people who can care about you so that when you go over, you're not drowning. You can't control them drowning. They're drowning. But you can work at it enough so that when you go over, you're not. This is pretty long. It, it all stems from one night at my son's house, and it is pretty long. But we'll, we'll sort of get started, and we may not finish. This is an issue I feel guilty about, but true nonetheless. I have two grandchildren, a girl nine, boy six. It's hard to admit, but the girl is easier for me to love than the boy. Ah, parents, parents will not admit this. Grandchildren, grandparents admit it more easily. She tends to be a little sassy, a bit of an attacker. He's taken the role of an aggressive victim, which shows up as whining and temper tantrums. For whatever reason, whining drains any love I feel much quicker than attacking. I'm continually thinking that if I were better, more loving, felt more loved, that I wouldn't feel this way, and I wouldn't be so responsive to Holly's obvious affection for me. Um, got lost. And Jack's lack of it which has gone on long before he established his victim role. It's not the right way or the loving way to be, but there you have it. So what she's admitting is, I love my granddaughter more than my grandson. Sure, I bet you do. She's easier to love than he is because she gives you more in return. Yeah, what you're really admitting is you have in large part, a conditionally loving relationship with your grandchildren. So what? You're learning about real love, and you're learning how to become more and more unconditionally loving with them. Yeah, great. It's a process of learning. And in the short term, you're simply admitting that you're learning, and that there are many times that you are not unconditionally loving. Well, good for you. As opposed to most parents who say, oh no, I love my children equally. <sighs> yeah, right. Fat chance you do. So your granddaughter gives to you and he doesn't. You like her more. He whines and then you feel obligated to fix him. Oh, which of us likes to be around a whiner? Well, you're not obligated to fix this kid. Then she continues, last week I watched the grandchildren while my son and his wife went to a company party. Usually the kids are home, we watch a movie or something. This night was a bit chaotic because, uh, actually I'm going to skip this one. Yep. All right, let's do this instead. Holly and Jack 
both have a small Nintendo uh, handheld game consoles. Jax was taken from him as a punishment until he earns it back. So Jack is the little victimy whiner. Holly went upstairs to get the game card, so his was taken. She went to get the game card out of Jack's Nintendo so she could use it in hers, and she left his Nintendo on the floor instead of putting it back on top of the cabinet. Jack went upstairs, got his Nintendo off the floor, and brought it downstairs. I told him he couldn't have it and asked Holly to show me where it was supposed to go. So grandmother and Holly go upstairs to put it back where it belongs, and when they got back downstairs, Jack had changed the channel of the television from the show they were watching. Gee, surprise. So, oh, what a series of mistakes we make, and it gets worse and worse. Right off the bat, you screw up, and it gets worse. So look what happened. Jack goes upstairs and gets the Nintendo he's not supposed to get and takes it downstairs. What's your first mistake? Jack's the one that made the decision to take the Nintendo downstairs. He makes the bad decision to bring it downstairs, and who decides, and so who should have taken the Nintendo back upstairs after he took it downstairs? Jack should have taken it back upstairs. But instead, who took it upstairs? You did. You decided to play his personal slave and right the wrong of his bad choice. What are you doing doing his slave work for him? and taking the consequences of his bad decision. So while you're upstairs doing his dirty work for him, he changes the channel of the television. Oh, what a web we weave. And so while you're gone, he screws up. Then when you come downstairs, Holly begins to scream at him because he's changed the television. <laughs> well, by now you're already insane. And and then you lose it. You don't know what you're doing. So you start getting involved in this screaming match. And so you go to change the television back instead of stopping right what you're doing and doing what every parent and grandchild, grandparent should do, which is love and teach. You could have stopped everything by stopping right then and loving and teaching Holly. As soon as anybody behaves badly, you stop what you're doing. You love and teach Holly and say, if Holly is screaming, you just stop and say, I know you're trying to say something in English, but I don't understand it. Because if she's screaming, there's absolutely no reason for her to be doing that. So you say, I, I would be able to understand you, but your face looks like this. And what you do is you contort your face in whatever horrible expression she's using as she's screaming. And you say your voice is really loud. And because of the volume, I can't hear what you're saying. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could speak to me, I could understand what you're saying. Then you listen to her, what she's saying about the television. Then you turn to Jack and you talk to him about the decision that he made to change the television which, of course, wasn't his decision to make since you were all watching something else. You love and teach. When you have people who are in a state of hysteria and you add your own protecting behaviors to the situation, you turn it into nuclear war. Whereas when you add loving and teaching, everything tends to calm down. And that was where you screwed up. It gets way easier. So instead, you just sort of took over and controlled things. Um, we're going to come back in a little bit because there's more situations here with the uh, grandmother and the two little terror children, terrorist children. But I don't want to take too long of this before we go on to some other questions because there are a lot of questions this evening. Okay, let me go to some live questions first before we go on. Um, I have acted like a vicarious victim with my mom for many years. She often still calls me with her victim stories dealing with her sister who doesn't want to have anything to do with her, her work-related slights, and so on. In the past, 
I have sympathized with her. We love to be vicarious victims because when people call and go, oh, oh, the terrible things that have happened to me, there's there's nothing that will get us instant hero status like sympathizing with a victim. Um, in the past, I have sympathized with her and fed her victimhood vicariously. How can I do this differently? I don't know how to love her without joining her victim team. Oh, so simple. So when a victim calls you and they say, oh, this person did that to me. Um, that person did that to me. Oh, my sister does this. So let's just pick one of them. So your mother calls and she says, my sister did that terrible thing to me. Just as calmly as, as you please, you say, have you ever wondered why your sister behaves like that? Well, now your mother is forced into a terrible position. For the first time, somebody is not sympathizing with her, and she now has to say, well, um, I, I guess so. Now, she either has to say, no, I've never wondered, and make you look stupid, or make herself look stupid, or she has to say, oh, okay, I guess I've wondered. And then you say, what I've learned um, recently as I've been studying the behavior of people is that when people behave badly and then you name the behavior of her sister, they're always responding to something that's missing in their lives. And the thing that they're missing is always a feeling of connection to other people. The thing that people want more than anything else is to feel unconditionally loved. And when they don't have enough of that, they respond by, and then you name several behaviors, you know, like lying, attacking, acting like victims, uh, running. And your sister happens to choose the behavior of blank. And you name the behavior that she uses with your mother. You're describing your mother's sister's behavior. You're making it understandable. You're not excusing it. You're not saying it's okay. You're not sympathizing with your mother. You're not justifying her, her sister's behavior. Ooh, terrible. You're not taking sides in any way. You're explaining it. Your mother will be stunned by this because it's never happened before. You're not taking sides, critical. If you do that consistently, whenever your mother complains, What's going to happen is she's either going to come to a new understanding of human beings or, well, whatever happens, it's going to be no fun for her to complain because you're not offering sympathy anymore. She's going to hate complaining to you. She's going to have lost a source of sympathy. And you're not going to hear the complaints. You win. So... You can't lose. She may not like hearing what you're going to say. Now, so she'll either quit complaining to you or she will continue to tell the stories so she can learn something. It doesn't matter why she quits complaining. Either she quits complaining just because she hates hearing what you're going to say or because she's interested in the principles of real love. It doesn't matter which reason. Either way, you quit hearing the complaining. So you win. You don't care which reason why, but... End of the, of, the, of the griping. And I've had dozens and dozens of people try this. And, which, and the people that they do this with consistently quit complaining. It's a hoot. So try it with her. Um, oh, yeah, that was Karen. Thanks. The grandmother. Thanks for that. John says, I've been involved with real love for a few years now, and I still have an issue with my mind thinking about how I could assist my ex-wife with telling the truth about herself. I do this almost nightly, even during downtime during the day. It is, of course, my expectation that if she were able to tell the truth about herself, that we could find each other again and then be able to raise our son in a nuclear real love family. Yes, I violate the, law, the rule of expectations on this issue, and I just can't stop. To make matters worse, I look at my son and then I think about how much he is missing by not having his mother and I as a married real love family. I get to be a victim to a degree in this case. When she chooses to be with others over him or she chooses material things, I see. When she chooses to be with others as opposed to being with him or she chooses material things over him, it disappoints me greatly. 
okay, I can't stand it, the fact that she can't see what she does. I need some additional assistance on getting over this big hill. Um, I really get this. It's still a huge disappointment that your life partner and the mother of your child has chosen to dump an opportunity to be with a, an extraordinarily happy nuclear family and instead has wandered off and chosen a life of essentially frivolous enjoyment of imitation love. Pretty much capture that, I get it. And that won't go away until you're filled enough, not just with understanding, but with experiences where you feel more filled with the feeling of being loved. Now, could be could be missing something here, but it's my impression that you really get the principles of real love, like get them to the bone, but that you need more experiences in person and on the phone, but especially in person, where people actually see you and love you. You need more loving experiences where you feel loved and not just understand love. And that's my impression. The more you feel it by more people, the less you'll care that this woman just chose to walk off and dump you. And the more that you will then be able to pass on that feeling to your son and will be able to feel more like a nuclear family without her. You really will. It takes one unconditionally loving parent to raise a happy child. It would be really cool to have two, but it doesn't take two. And if there's something I can do to help you about that, um, you let me know. Call me. Carmen says, I have a similar problem with one of my daughters as uh, Melissa has with her mom. Um, so I guess my answer would be the same. When people whine at you, you simply respond not by telling them not to whine, not by trying to change them. Do never tell a victim to stop whining. All that does is make them feel more victimized. You respond to a victim by loving them and telling them the truth. Victims hate the truth. And the more you tell a victim the truth, they will either listen to the truth or they will hate the truth and leave you alone. And don't you win either way? And I don't mean it in a mean way. My son's wife is teaching the children by example to... Um, I'm going to come back to this because... Um, I want to do a couple more of these that uh, were sent. My child is six years old and was caught drawing a naked woman at school. The school freaked out and told him it was bad and disciplined him for it. My son also told his great parents about it. Great, excuse me, his great grandparents about it. And they freaked out, and I really don't know what to do or how to discuss this with my child. The child is six. He's not 16. Pay attention. Um, Six-year-olds don't go around having sexual fantasies. Um, he's six. So what you say to the child is, uh, who's six years old, um, Billy, um, do you ever see mom and dad walking around uh, naked around the house? No. Do you see any of the uh, teachers or kids at school walking around naked at school? No. Do you see any of the people uh, at the mall walking around naked? No. No, we call that, there's a name for that. It's called modesty. Um, it's, it's just what people do. People, when they're outside of their bedrooms, and when they're outside of their bathrooms, 
when they're not bathing, when they're not changing clothes, when they're not in bed sleeping, they, they dress. And that's the way people prefer to be seen. That's the way they prefer to see other people. So when you're drawing pictures of people, um, modest, because of modesty, it's better to draw them with their clothes on. Does that make sense? And so he goes, okay. And that's how big a deal you make of it. So when the school makes a great big deal of it, they have traumatized the child far more than the child drawing a naked picture. So the school has unnecessarily traumatized the child and they should be kept after school in study hall. Uh, so the school has responded stupidly and should be disciplined, not the child. So you just tell the child that some adults get a little too excited about the things that children do and that he just needs to draw pictures of people with their clothes on. Ridiculous. I've been hired as a house manager where most of the job is cooking, cleaning, shopping, and so on. I also care for twin boys who are four years old. They're pretty aggressive and don't know the word no too well. Gee, I wonder where they learned that. That would not be a child problem. Um, and then he adds, I see it in the parents. I don't, actually, I don't know if it's a he. I see it in the parents, but that's how they are. So when the kids do something the parents really don't like, biting, <laughs> or talking with bad words, the parents say they wash the boy's mouth out with soap. Yeah, that's a real natural consequence, you know, since we do that with adults all the time, you know. Say a bad word, we wash adults' mouths out with soap. So they want me to do that as well, and I just don't feel like I could do that. Good for you. The one incident was that one boy didn't want to share something and he bit the other boy. I understand that this is not acceptable. But just uh, I understand this, so not acceptable. So anyway, the sentence isn't clear. So, so should I use just a timeout? In real love, what would the discipline be? <coughs> it's not about what the discipline would be. It's always about what is love and teach. Love and teach is always the, the appropriate response to a child. So before we leap to discipline, which is just the wrong approach entirely, it's always love and teach, love and teach. So a child bites another child. And so I immediately sit down with a four-year-old and I say, um, so what did you just do? Well, I just bit Jacob. Hmm. Do I ever bite you? No. Would you like it if I bit you? Would you like it if I bit you now? Would you like me to bite you now? Of course, and then I would open my mouth as though to bite him. Would you like me to bite you now? No. Any four-year-old, if I opened my mouth wide, would say no. So why would you like me? Would you not like me to bite you now? Because it would hurt. Right. Do you think it hurt your brother when you bit him? Yes. So... Do you think your brother felt happy when you bit him? No. Do you think he'd like him to bite you again? Or do you think, yeah, do you think he'd like, yeah, you to bite him again? No. So it's not a good thing to do to bite other people, is it? So why did you bite him? And then he tells you because he took my whatever it is. So what's another way that you could, what's another thing you could do when he does that? and you go over some other options that he could exercise when his brother takes something from him. Some things he could say, some things he could do. And then you show him how that if he did these other things, you show him how much happier both of them would be if they did that versus the biting, which didn't work out well for either of them. And then you re-emphasize that, for example, if something went, well, went awry between the two of you, if you bit him, he wouldn't like it. 
when he bit his brother, it didn't turn out very well. Whereas opposed to the new way that you just talked about, mm, that could work out pretty well. In fact, then what you do is you role play it and you try it right there. You try the new way. Kids love to role play. They love to play games. That's why they play house. That's why they play games in sandboxes. So you love and teach. Kids behave stupidly in great part because nobody's ever shown them how to behave more wisely. So love and teach, love and teach. Whereas opposed to we're sticking them in the sink and sticking soap in their mouths. Does anybody see any imaginable natural link between biting and soap? As opposed to let's show them a smarter way to do it. There's no reason to send a kid to time out. That doesn't teach him a better way to behave. I've almost never had to send a kid to his room. Now, if you teach a kid a better way to behave repeatedly, uh, over and over, and it doesn't work, maybe on a, an, another occasion, another webcast, we'll talk about sending a kid to his room. But first, you try the loving and teaching quite a few times. Whereas here, we haven't even given loving and teaching a shot. So let's not go to pulling pistols and killing people before we've tried loving and teaching, okay? Carmen was saying, Greg, I'm afraid my daughter will not want to talk to me any longer because she's looking for sympathy. Oh, like um, uh, Melissa's mother. Okay, I get it. All right, you got to remember that when somebody's looking for sympathy, you're not, you're not throwing real love explanations in their face like ammunition. You're not saying, well, now, now see, she only does that because she doesn't feel loved. No, you're just, you're casually offering explanations. You know, I've come to understand that people act like that because of this and this. This is, these are compassionate, calm, loving explanations. And you got to understand this. Although I've seen a number of occasions where, for example, an older person will quit complaining to a younger person, an, a, a, a mother to a daughter. If your daughter is coming to you and complaining, children tend to continue to come to their parents who offer explanations like this because they're actually looking to their parents for wisdom. So I suggest that you drop these little pearls of wisdom. You're not dropping great big volumes of lectures. These are just little pearls of observations that you're dropping here and there. These are not conversation stoppers. And if you'll do them here and there and you see what happens, it's infinitely better than letting the streams of whining and complaining and victimhood continue unabated. Um, Donna Arvin has a question there if you would. Thank you. Really? Really? Oh. Sorry about that, Saber Dues. Unintentionally, I skipped right over your entry. My son's wife is teaching. Son's wife, I get this right. Son's wife is teaching the children by example to disrespect him uh, by calling him fat, old, stupid, etc. I find this upsetting. I'm worried about all of them and their happiness. The kids are only six and eight. Really. What is, what is going to happen to them by the time that they're in their teens? Hmm. Well, yeah, that's pretty disrespectful, all right. I don't know who's going to be the one who's going to do this. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know whether anybody is capable of being taught. So I don't know whether it's your business or whether I don't know who in the family is capable of hearing what you'd have to say, whether it would be your son, whether it be your son's wife, but somebody at some point needs to speak to the kids and talk to them about the um, 
damage caused by unkind words. And this is really simple. Um, you sit down in a family meeting and you talk to the kids about how harmful it is to be called names. And you ask the kids, uh, how would you like it if you were called and you make up names? Um, stupid head, um, ugly, fat, um, idiot. Um, does anybody like to be called those names? Nobody does. Everybody likes to be loved and respected. And so in our family, we're going to make an effort to never use those words and to always be loving. So from now on, whenever anybody uses those words, whoever hears them is going to stop and look at whoever uses those words and simply say, is that the kind of loving word that you want to use? Or do you want to think about it and come up with another word to use? Rather than saying, stop it. As soon as you say to somebody, stop it or don't, you're pretty much guaranteed to get into a power struggle and you're going to lose from that. Trying to control somebody, you're not going to win. Whereas loving and teaching is a win. That's why it's a matter of instructing, loving, accepting, teaching, and saying, so is that the kind of language you want to use? If these kids are six and eight, they're not beyond hearing that kind of teaching. Uh, you start them early enough and they'll hear it. It's also a really good idea if these people are capable of hearing this kind of thing. Uh, I'm just not sure whether your son and his wife are, are willing to. But that's the age where it's not uh, too early to have the family be reading the Real Love and Parenting book together. Sounds like they could use it. If you've got kids calling a parent fat, old and stupid, um, that would be a good family to be reading that book for a fact. My eight-year-old son said that his dad called my ex-boyfriend a dork for playing video games. Uh, Jacob became very close to my boyfriend and considers him to be a friend. Jacob also expressed that he really loves and misses my boyfriend. So it was tough to hear his dad, my ex-husband, um, speak of my ex-boyfriend in these negative ways. Jacob would like to know how to deal with this situation and what to say to his dad. Pretty hard to have a kid instruct his dad about anything, but you can say this to your son. Um, you can say to Jacob, so Jacob, why do people call other people names? Give him a second answer. He's heard enough about real love that he can probably answer this, but if he can't, you can. You can say, people call other people names only when they are feeling unhappy and empty themselves. And you can answer that for him both from your perspective and from his. You can say, the only times I ever get mad at you is when I'm feeling unhappy. And you say, think about it. When you are feeling happy and things are going well for you, do you ever call your brother names? No. But when you're feeling unhappy and grouchy and awful, then you tend to call your brother names, don't you? And the same is true with your dad. When he is feeling unhappy and empty, he tends to call other people names. And that's why he called my ex-boyfriend a dork. He did it not because it's true, but because he was feeling unhappy. And when we call other people names, it puts them down and makes us feel stronger. So you don't have to do anything about it. You just need to understand why he does it. It's not kind and it's not loving. If you want to say anything about it, you don't have to, but if you want to, and the next time he says, oh, he's a dork, you could say, so what do you mean by a dork? Why do you call him a dork instead of being kind and loving? If you were to say that, dad would be kind of embarrassed and realize that he isn't being kind. Uh, but you don't have to say anything. If you want to, that's something that you could say. 
Because adults can be unkind and foolish in the same way that kids have. Kids can be. In fact, probably worse. Our 17-year-old is becoming serious with a girl against our advice. He's becoming, he has become dishonest about where he is and doesn't answer his cell phone when we call. We have carefully explained the rules concerning his telling the truth about where he is, yet his dishonesty continues. My husband feels we should take car away, car and phone, because he has not followed instructions. Is this consequence too severe for a 17, almost 18-year-old? Man, 17, 18 years old, you know, I mean, the kid's gone. I mean, at that age, he's just about out of the house. So, you know, I would tell the kid the single most important decision, the single most important uh, characteristic that we need most from you is for you to be honest with us. And after 17 years of our being able to teach you what's right and wrong, it's uh, we're pretty much at the end of the road when it comes to influencing your decisions. So we've taught you what's right. We've taught you what's wrong. We've taught you what's moral, immoral. And now you're uh, pretty much out in the real world applying what we've taught you. And we realize that uh, we're not going to make a whole lot of difference at this point. Uh, But you are using um, our car and you are using our resources uh, to uh, fund your efforts. So if you're going to use our car and our phone, at least we need to know where you are using those things. So we want to know where you are and we do expect you to answer the phone. And we do at least need to know where you are in case we need to get a hold of you. So that's the one thing we require. We need to know where you are and we need you to answer the phone. And uh, if you want to continue to use those resources, that's the one requirement we have is knowledge of your whereabouts. Uh, If you want to continue to use the phone, if you want to continue to use those resources which we supply, then we require knowledge of where you are. If you choose not to answer the phone and not to let us know where you are, that is not a problem but you'll no longer have access to those resources. So it's your choice. It's your pick. The next time you don't answer the phone, you won't have those resources. But what you choose to do with the girl and where you choose to go, you're a big kid. Um, You're going to get to make those choices on your own. But we want to know where you are. That's just my suggestion. What you choose to do is up to you. But forcing a 17-year-old to make decisions that you want about a particular girl, oh, best of luck about that. But getting to know where he is, still a minor. You do get to know where he is. I often find myself um, taking the lead and talking about sex to my adult son as well as most of life's important decisions. I've done this for years, and I know that he'd like to talk to his dad on some things instead of me, but his dad doesn't relate. I feel that my son is missing out on male bonding. Is he? Uh, Is male bonding real or important? Yeah. Yeah, it is real real and important, and it would be delightful if your son uh, got to talk to his father and hear this stuff from a man. So he is missing out on some, but it's not critical. What's most important is that he gets to talk to somebody who cares about him. Get me? Like I was talking about earlier, what matters most is that a child has a source of unconditional love. That is the thing. If a child had two sources, if every boy had a male model, oh, I just, I would just love that. If every daughter had a Uh, mother to model, I'd love that, but it's not absolutely essential. Um, If your son had um, somebody that could model unconditional love for him that was a man, uh, that'd be neat. But if what he's got is you, um, he'll figure it out. He'll be okay. Yeah, I'd love it if it was his dad, but you can't make his dad do it for him. Uh, You can't make his dad be that role model. 
and it's not going to kill him. I'm thrilled he's got you. Recently, I've been reading Real Love Materials to the kids, sometimes paraphrasing it for a younger audience. My oldest seems to be taking it in really well, but my six-year-old gives me a hard time. He'll say things like, real love, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But when I asked him last night whether he likes for me to read it, he said, yes. What do you think's happening here? Oh, this isn't hard. He's six. <laughs> six. <laughs> Six-year-olds don't like to sit and have things read to him. They're six years old. And yet, at six, he still recognizes that something important is going on. So he doesn't want you to quit, which is pretty cool which shows that you're teaching the kids something. That's neat. My 16-month-old son is beginning to fight having his diapers changed to the point of arching his back, kicking, screaming, and hitting. He throws similarly huge tantrums while being buckled into his car seat to the point where he deliberately hits my husband in the face. 16 months old, get this. My in-laws, friends, and even my husband say I'm too soft in allowing my son to throw these tantrums and they want me to spank my son. How can I best teach him not to kick, hit, or otherwise throw a tantrum uh, when he's you know, with the diapers and getting into the car seat? Is there an appropriate consequence based upon real love? Sure. Um, hitting a kid doesn't work. There is no way to strike a child that a child will continue to feel unconditionally loved. I've never found a way to do that. However... There are some way to, ways to administer natural consequences to a 16-month-old that gets it across to them that they can't scream, kick, and hit you. Um, my daughter has a very active daughter. Uh, this child <laughs> is, is a wild kid. And she used to do this when we were strapping her into her car seat. Just the throwing and the kicking and the... Now, kicking you in the face, I don't understand because... Look at the relative arm length of an adult compared to a 16-month-old. I mean, what's wrong with you if you're getting your face close enough to get your face hit? So I went to put her in her, face, in, in her car seat one time, and I easily put her in her car seat, and my daughter went, what did you do? I mean, I did it easily. And then I did it easily twice and three times, and so my daughter said, what's the trick? And I said, come here. <laughs> and so... I took the, the little, I think she was 16, 18 months old, and I put her in her car seat. And she started to kick and thrash. And I just took my left hand, and you just push harder. And, and as soon as she starts to kick and thrash, you push harder and harder on her chest to where it becomes slightly difficult to breathe. A little. And they go, <clears throat> and as soon as it becomes a little difficult to breathe, they quit thrashing. It's amazing. And then you let up. And they, go, they look at you like, what was that? <laughs> you just push them right against the back of the car seat. Fairly hard. But with no anger. You just push them firmly. It's exactly like training a dog. I'm not kidding. That's how you train dogs not to have little fits. That, little, it's, a, it's a way of training alpha male dogs that like bark at other dogs. There's actually a little training thing on doing that. And you put, and they, they look at you like, the kid looks at you like, what was that? It was uncomfortable, but it wasn't violent. And so she'd look at me like, what did you do? And then I'd keep buckling her, and she'd start to thrash, and I'd push hard on her chest again, and she'd quit thrashing. And I'd go, and I would just smile and sing to her and keep buckling her in. And as soon as she'd thrash, I'd push hard on her chest again, while singing and smiling, and I'd have her all buckled in, and she'd look at me like, I've been conned. <laughs> and she learned that if you thrash, it's not fun, and if you don't thrash, it is fun. It's just like training a dog. And when you're 16 months old, the comparison is actually fairly apt. They just need to be trained. You don't reason with a 16-month-old, just like you were apply, implying here. They, you can't reason with them, but you do have to tell them it's not okay to punch people in the face and to thrash and kick when you're changing your diapers. And I use the same technique when I'm changing the diaper of a little kid. You just make it 
unpleasant. You just push down on them when you're changing their diapers. And they look at you like, well, this is no fun. But you're singing and smiling at them. And they're looking at you like, what in the world? But they don't like it. And as soon as they quit thrashing, you let up. And it's amazing how quick, they're not stupid. It's amazing how quickly they catch on. It's exactly like training a dog. And nobody's mean and nobody's mad and everybody's happy and nobody gets punched in the face. So, um, so I love you all. And um, see if I missed any questions here. I may have. Yep. No, didn't. So I've still got some that I didn't get to from last week, and we'll see you guys in a week. And I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, and love you just tons. See you then.